Hi, I'm John Blyler, Editor-in-Chief of Chip Design and Embedded Intel Magazines. Tonight, I'm here with Dr. Mario Livio, astrophysicist and author of a recent book, Brilliant Blenders. This is about how some of the greatest scientists and minds of the last several centuries, at least, uh, made brilliant blunders on the way to find you know, brilliant discoveries. Um, should we... Um, should we be encouraged then to, to make mistakes uh, from our science and engineering uh, tech uh, worlds? Well, we, we shouldn't encourage sloppy science, <laughs> for sure. Uh, we shouldn't encourage people to make mistakes deliberately uh, and without thinking about them. Uh, but we should encourage to have the possibility to make brilliant blunders. And what I mean by that is that we should design the process in such a way that it will allow for outside-the-box thinking. Uh, and when you allow for thinking that is not conventional, that is innovative, then it means that you are willing to take the risk that maybe some blunders will occur. Um, and we shou should make the process in such a way that it allows for these types of, you know, what I call brilliant blunders. Today, there's lots of budget cuts going on, and R&D is being hammered from all directions. And I'm sure there's a tendency to say, we want low risk. We don't want, maybe we'll have brilliant blunders, but we, we can't tell. What would you, how would you address so that question? So you, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, there is a strong aversion from mistakes, you know, and so on. And especially when uh, funding is low, uh, I mean, there is even more so. Uh, the problem with that is that if you are too careful, uh, and if you go too much mainstream, then uh, all you're going to get is incremental science, uh, and uh, most of the time. And there is nothing wrong with that. It's just that you may be missing some opportunities for breakthroughs, uh, which maybe are not accessible through incremental science. Um, and so the idea is to design the process in such a way that it would still somehow allow for these other possibilities. And I want to give you an example. I worked with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, for many years now. Uh, until about a decade ago, uh, we, we did the following. You see, people f every year apply for time on the telescope to make, uh, they propose to make observations with the telescope. There is a huge oversubscription of the telescope. So m many more people apply than there actually is time in a given year. Uh, but until about a decade ago, uh, the time allocation committees, those committees of experts that give the time eventually, you know, judge all the proposals, were encouraged to give up to about 10% of the telescope time to what were deemed risky proposals. And by that, what was meant were proposals that it really wasn't certain whether they can achieve their objectives, but that if they could actually achieve their goal, then the, there was a big potential for big return. Um, so I this is a, uh, an example of a process which in, in the process there is this um, risk taking, which tries to allow for sometimes for serendipity, sometimes for you know some some thinking that is not so conventional. In the world that I'm involved with a lot, it's semiconductors and developing you know transistors the size of atoms and using new materials and things like that. It's very, it's very expensive. There's only a few fabs in the world that uh, can even play in that that game anymore, and um, I'm sure it's tricky for them. But, but uh, perhaps material science is a way to approach it. It would seem to me, I know you're an astrophysicist, but it would seem to me material science and other areas like that would benefit from you know, taking that little bit of risk but having it built in. I'm, I'm not sure how you'd fund it, but. Probably in those kind of processes, it is best to try to take those risks as early as possible. Because, I mean, you know, if you have developed the whole thing and you, know, you encounter a blunder at the end, then this can be very costly. But if you kind of, in the original thinking, you know, in the initial stages, you allow for this, you know, unconventional thinking, then, you know, even if you, you hit upon a, a blind alley, you know, it didn't cost that much, you know, to do that because you can, you know, restart and, and so on. It, it seems to me that, you know, there's a, there's a big push for, for high-level modeling, system modeling. I would think there, perhaps, uh, 
you could begin analyzing different risk-taking scenarios, and that might even help. Again, something you would do early on. That's right. And maybe you, I, I just, right. maybe you do that in right. with. And, and even maybe with some element of risk analysis, you know, and and so on. But but to allow for that element, because, uh, for example, uh, you may know that. Uh, in medicine, you know, in, when you look at the discoveries of new medications for different things, uh, the claim is that maybe close to 90% of them come serendipitously. Mm. Um, you know, you, you, you try to develop something for one disease and they suddenly they discover that actually it works for something else, you know, and so on. And, and there are many, many examples for this. I mean, you know, there are examples that uh, have to do with, for example, the medications against depression, mm -hmm. which were originally used against tuberculosis, you know, and things of that nature, or medications that uh, were developed for high blood pressure and in fact turned out to be something completely different and so Somehow on. the process uh, should be arranged in such a way that serendipity would be allowed to play a role in, in all of this. Thank you very much, Dr. Livio. My pleasure. This is part of the ISEPP series, the Linus Pauling Lectures, of which Terry Bristol is a director.